So there are still some free spots back back there if you like to sit. So Get the hardware wallet. It's a basically an advice given to store cryptocurrencies securely. But are they really secure in reality? And what are the attack vectors the current existing hardware wallets cannot protect us against? How does actually open source and peer review work with respect to hardware development? And what are the other ways how to secure digital assets uh, yeah, how to secure digital assets. It will be a topic uh, of our next speaker, Peter Todd, an applied uh, cryptography consultant and Bitcoin developer. Welcome. Thank you. So software won't let you boot them anymore. You know, it's not that easy to go and install new software on a lot of this hardware. You know, your average, uh, your average phone these days, you probably couldn't. So it kind of concerned me, people talking about this. And, but, you know, more to the point of this talk, well, the reason is really, well, why? You know, what is it about the security model of hardware wallets? And um, as for the tr Twitter drama, well, that was kind of their response. Uh, yeah. And uh, along with all those lines, I'll give you a little disclaimer, too, which is um, that's the CTO of Tracer just wanted you to know about how much I know about hardware wallets. For what it's worth, my uh, previous line of work was actually analog electronics designer, so I uh, do, do a fair bit of experience with electronics, but more in the sort of squishy analog bits rather than the digital side of things. But, you know, we really got to start with the status quo. Without a hardware wallet, what are you doing when you have a wallet? You know, that's my actual laptop sitting there with a copy of Electrum that I just installed in a new Cubes VM and all that, and that's the screen you get when you start up Electrum. You've got a QR code, you know, you've got various other bits. Go zoom in a bit to go see it better. Yeah, and that's me receiving a payment. And it's important to remember, I'm not looking at that, I'm looking at that. And what really matters is, how is it that I know that that thing will do what I want. Or put another way, I mean, well, what, what threats are we preventing? And you've really got three big things that can go wrong. You know, you've got my coins just getting stolen, which is namely the bad guy getting a copy of the private key, and then they can just do whatever they want, probably take the coins. You've got interception, which is, well, if I'm sending money to you, or you're sending money to me, if the bad guy doesn't have the private keys, they might be able to trick me into either sending money to the wrong place or telling you to send money to the wrong place. You know, so for the first one, suppose I have a fresh wallet and I want to go load some more funds on it. I go tell you, hey, you know, my computer says Bitcoin address QP, whatever, whatever, is the right one to go send me money and you send money. And I go sit there, it looks like it works, and then eventually I realize, oh, wait a second. That was actually the bad guy's address, not my address. Equally, once I have those Bitcoins, even if they really are on my computer, if they can fool me into sending it to the wrong place, again, I'm screwed. You expected me to give you money, I accidentally gave the bad guy money. And the third one is just general screw-ups. 
And a really good example of this is actually from a few years ago on uh, blockchain.info, when their wallet, or wait, sorry, I got this wrong, Mt. Gox. Sorry, you know, trying to convince myself that Mt. Gox isn't that bad. No, yet another one of Mt. Gox's screw-ups, I believe, was they managed to go send money to an invalid address. You know, quite, at the time it wasn't that much money, but given that Bitcoin was probably worth a dollar back then or something, it's tens of millions of dollars now. And that screw-up was ultimately, you know, bad code. The money went to an address that cannot be spent, and thus they lose their Bitcoin. But, you know, most of what we think about is theft and interception. Screw-ups is more of a code quality issue. So let's suppose I do get a hardware wallet. Well, ah, there you go. And I, I should, should say, just generally, like, this is really um, what you call trusted computing. You know, this idea that I can go trust what, what my computer is doing, that it will go and obey my orders. You know, and that's really where the hardware wallet concept comes from. So, you know, there's your hardware wallet. And the advice is I go buy one, right? That particular one I bought a couple days ago um, at a sketchy place in Slovenia. And the assumption is that should be an example of trusted computing. You know, that piece of hardware should do what I want it to do. And it should tell me what it's doing, honestly. Well, I mean, let's look at it. That's the actual box it's in before I opened. Um, it's a little hard to see on the screen, but it's shrink-wrapped. But notably, there's no, like, seal on here. There's no real hologram. It's just, you know, a piece of shrink wrap that uh, anyone can go and per, you know, put on a box with a couple dollars worth of hardware. And interestingly, if you open it up, it's got a little notice. In that notice, you certainly can't read it, but what it really says is, you know, did you notice that this thing isn't sealed? There's no holograms, there's no nothing. Well, inside this, there's supposed to be a little chip that attests its validity to software. And that little chip is supposed to be secure. And that chip shouldn't be possible for the hackers to get into, even in transit. In fact, they go as far to go say that if you were to go buy one of those things from like eBay, it should be safe. Or, you know, for that matter, if you uh, were to go and buy my one, it shouldn't be possible for me to go and do something to this device to go and steal your Bitcoins. Interesting claim. Well, I mean, let's look at how does this user experience work, you know? Again, that's my, uh, my laptop, and that's my device, and, you know, when I'm doing stuff on this, I'm hooking this up to my laptop, and with the default Tracer, or sorry, default Ledger software it comes with, and I know Tracer works similarly. Um, don't want purely single Ledger out here, but happens to be the device I was using. It's a sort of a dual confirm thing. So let's go through the scenarios. I want you to send me money. I generate an address on, ultimately on this device, and that address pops up on the device and it pops up on my screen. And it goes for asking me, please go verify that the address on the screen matches the address on the device. And then presumably I give you that address somehow and you send me Bitcoins. Well, let's ask for a second. So I'm holding this, but I'm also holding my laptop. How did I send you that address? Chances are I typed into, say, my email or somewhere, you know, put it into a form on a website or something. So I'm actually using the device I assumed was compromised for this very trustworthy thing. Now, if you're a malware writer, well, what are you going to do about that? I mean, if you compromise my computer, why don't you just go and swap out the address in the background? Because remember, I'm looking at a screen. I don't know what's actually happening behind that screen. All I see is what the screen's showing me. It's very easy for you as a malware writer to just swap out the address in the background and display me what I'm expecting to see here. So I'm not sure it really helped us there. Let's go to the next stage, which is I did somehow get money on this device and I want to send it to someone. Well, again, the process of this is I put address into that app. The address pops up here. 
I verify, I verify how much I'm gonna send, et cetera, et cetera. That's sort of a dual confirm thing. But again, we gotta ask the question, where did that address come from? Were you, say, looking at your cheapair.com, buying a $1,000 plane ticket, and that address popped up on the screen that you assume is compromised? Well, realistically, yes, it probably, that's probably how you're using it. And then you get the final thing of, well, ignoring both those two, let's assume that somehow we get money into this device, and we're just talking about, can the bad guy steal it? Well, I mean, this, the private key is supposed to be in this. It's not on my computer. So until they at least get me to send all my money, maybe they won't be able to steal it. Or, you know, maybe we can make another assumption, which is that I never spend a large enough amount of money that it's worth it for them to do some shenanigans about replacing addresses, and thus I never lose it. Or, you know, maybe we assume that I'm double-checking something somewhere along the lines. You know, maybe I go to my exchange and I look it up on their website, and then I go call them and verify the address for a secondary path. Now, um, put up your hands. How many people in this room have done that? All right, I see like, I'll, I'll give, be generous, 10 hands. You know, it's, it's really not very much. And, you know, I do a lot of security consulting as well. And I try to convince exchanges to make this standard processes for large amounts of money. It's, uh, it's an uphill battle. You know, they, some do it, a lot don't. But there's even bigger issues here, which is, well, what happens when you take a ledger apart? And again, I don't want to single out ledger here. Tracer, same kind of issues, but ledger is the one I had. So I can pop the back off this thing. It's just a standard injection molded case, little clips on the back. And when you take it apart, it still works. In fact, I sent a whole bunch of transactions with this in its state. You know, the, the device itself is not physically secure, which also means that that screen, the bad guy can do all kinds of stuff to what that screen is. You know, if I intercept your ledger in transit, I can put something in between there. I mean, I can put additional stuff onto that board. I could even redo the board, right? There's all kinds of things I can do with it. And I can put it back together again, because remember, this is just little clips, you know? I mean, I'm holding the same ledger I took apart, and uh, I would challenge you guys to figure out if I'd open this. You know, you're probably not going to be able to. And, you know, that's the physical hardware, but here's actual architecture. And for what's worth, credit goes to uh, Salem for this. I grabbed it off his website, off his uh, interesting write-up on similar issues. But I think the big thing is, well, what are the parts here? You know, you've got buttons, you've got a screen, an OLED screen, you've got the USB connection, which is ultimately goes to the computer, you've got the MCU, which is a little computer that runs it, and then you've got the SE, the secure element. But how do you know that any of this actually works that way? I mean, the key is in the SE, but how do you know that? You know, I, the bad guy, I can intercept one in transit, and I mean, I could put an additional box in there, or I could reprogram that little computer in there. I can do anything I want except change the box labeled SE. So, let's go through some examples. You know, have you heard about, say, the bad USB attacks? Where someone with a malicious USB device compromises your computer over the USB connection. And in fact, just over that way, you've got a bowl of uh, USB condoms, as they're called, that are supposed to protect against the attack. They only allow power through, not data. Well, you're not going to use a USB condom with this. It's got to communicate with your computer somehow. So if I, the bad guy, intercept one of your hardware wallets in, you know, in transit, I could go and make that box take over your computer first. You're not going to know that I just compromised your computer. The other thing is, assuming I can do this, even some of the time, maybe not reliably, I could also program that compromise to then make the software not actually do the verification. 
Remember, the whole point of the secure element is your computer is supposed to talk to the device and say, hey, are you real? If you're real, please attest that fact and, and tell me. But if you're a standard user, you just plugged it into something which could have compromised that attestation process, the verification process, and now you're not going to know that never happened. Also, because you don't know what's in the box, how do you know that the screen or the buttons ever actually communicates with any of this stuff? I could have rewritten all the software. In fact, I could even make it really clever where it says, all right, if I successfully compromise your computer, it'll do a special handshake with you know, the now compromised device and say, hey, this, you know, we were successful. Go display the UI where everyone gets screwed over and they lose their money. If we're unsuccessful, just pass through everything as normal. So it looks like a normal tracer and no one notices. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of room here because you haven't actually verified the security of this hardware. And finally, with regard to the screw-ups side of things, I mean, let's talk about software quality. You know, here's a notice um, Ledger actually had to go put out uh, a while back, um, August 2nd, where they pushed an update that, funny enough, replaced every Ethereum address for sending with a fixed one. Now, they didn't own the, that address. Doesn't sound like anyone really knows what that address is. And of course, if you sent money to that address, you'd get, you know, you'd get lost, you'd get stolen. So you've got to ask yourself, I mean, how did this happen? You know, there's supposed to be a company that has secure process and so on. Well, you know, I don't think it's so much a problem with them per se. I mean, it's a screw up, but people screw up. I think the bigger issue here is what happens when you go and trust your Bitcoin to a proprietary-ish device that relatively few people actually go and work on? You know, I mean, look at Bitcoin Core. With tons and tons of contributors, we still screwed up and allowed money to be inflated. You know, you need that kind of peer review to catch these kind of problems. Whereas if you're using a device that's relatively rare, you know, in terms of number of developers working on, or closed source because it's, you know, custom hardware that people aren't able to go hack, or, you know, even open source hardware, it's just, but it's made by one company and has like three guys working on releases. There's actually a lot of risks that you potentially have because you're not working on, you know, you're not using a device that has a lot of peer review. And it may not even be theft. I mean, this was an example of very suspicious potential theft, but it might be something as simple as, well, oh, turns out if you press these buttons in the right order, your Bitcoins get sent to the null address. You know, again, you need that kind of peer review to go catch these things. And there's also issues with languages. You know, a lot of the hardware wallets, the language used in them is C. You know, and unfortunately C, it's just not known for writing good code in. You know, there's a lot of things to go and catch mistakes. I'm very dubious about how these very anemic microprocessors wind up forcing design choices that ignore modern languages. You know, trays are actually interesting to their credit. Um, apparently, most of the actual code is written in Python, but a lot don't, uh, don't have those protections, and that definitely is an issue. So finally, maybe the last thing to go talk about is, like, what are the alternatives? You know, if a little device like this isn't, what else could we do? And I really liked um, Ryan Lackey's comment recently. Now, as you may have heard, there's allegedly by um, Bloomberg alleged that Supermicro has had their products backdoored. You know, allegedly some little tiny grain of sand size chip has been put in there by the Chinese and there's backdoors, et cetera, et cetera. But whether or not you believe that story is true, one thing about it is at least that the backdoor was supposedly targeted. You know, the allegations are not that every single motherboard shipped by Supermicro had this backdoor. The allegations are that some did namely the ones getting shipped off to you know, Apple, to Amazon, to other big companies. And well, why would the attacker do that? Well, the attacker doesn't want to get caught. You know, if you get noticed that you're backdooring things, you might get caught. 
Also, if you're backdooring things, it's expensive. You know, yes, it's relatively easy to open one of these things up and put some new components in, but you're still looking at probably at least $10 worth of time, even at cheap labor rates that you might find overseas. Potentially, it's a lot more expensive. So you want to target your attack to the people who it might actually impact. You know, I want to target your attack to the victims that you'll earn money off of. Well, when I bought my laptop, I bought my laptop from some random store with cash. Similarly, when I did the Zcash Trusted Setup, which is now you know, supposed to be the basis for you know, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of currency. We bought laptops with cash from random stores. What we did is we you know, took that supply chain and we bought anonymous cardware. It was very difficult to know where it would actually go, you know, who, which actual devices were worth backdooring. And we bought them with cash, and the attacker would have to compromise everything to successfully compromise the things that were valuable. You know, with my laptop, how do they know that I'm going to store Bitcoin on it? They're not going to know. So if you take this approach, well, what kind of hardware wallet could you use? You know, and I think Tails is actually an interesting example. Tails is a special Linux distribution designed for anonymity. You install it on a USB disk, you boot your computer with it. One of the many things it does, it has an Electrum wallet in it. That Electrum wallet, assuming that the USB disk was clean, you can assume that Electrum wallet is also clean, and thus it will not steal your coins. Well, maybe the better thing to do is not make yourself a target by buying special hardware, but instead use very off-the-shelf commodity hardware to go run very not off-the-shelf software. You know, maybe what we really need is more, more of this approach where you don't allow these supply chain attacks to happen and you just focus on the software. The software can be audited fairly easily. You know, and it's easy to cross-check. Like if I have a piece of software and I want to convince you that it's safe, or at least that it's the same software as we downloaded in the first place, at least we can cross-check our USB keys. It's a lot cheaper to cross-check a USB key than laboriously open one of these things, get out your nitric acid etcher and start looking at the chip. Yet, if that's your threat model, that's the kind of thing you have to go do. Because after all, in a device like this, I can always get my hot air gun, pull off the secure element, put on another board where everything but the secure elements has been modified to fit. And at scale, the board probably costs 10 bucks. Maybe I'm spending, you know, 50 bucks worth of time intercepting that. And probably one out of 10 times, that's going to wind up in the hands of a Bitcoin user who actually uses it and thus loses their coins. You know, so have we seen these attacks yet? Well, actually, yes, kind of. Um, these things do show up on eBay. And there's a very funny attack that happens, which is, so in the box itself, it comes with a little card. And the card, you're supposed to write down your private key. You know, write down the, the 12 words. Well, people get these things. The words are already filled out. And they're filled out by the bad guy, just to be clear. And the moment you load a significant amount of Bitcoin on one of these man-in-the-middle attack devices, you're going to lose your money. Now, that proves one thing at least, which is these supply chain attacks do happen. And it kind of says, well, maybe buying them off eBay isn't necessarily the best idea already. And I suspect as more education happens and people stop making mistakes that dumb, you might actually see real supply chain attacks, which work at the circuit board levels. But at least right now, we have lower hanging fruit to map, uh, concern ourselves with. So with that, thank you. So thank you very much for your talk. Now we have time for questions. See anybody this way? OK.
It's uh, not a question so much as a comment uh, regarding your last statement about the ledger man middle attacks. I think somebody's trying to do that right here because I saw pieces of paper selling ledgers uh, <laughs> yesterday, so I hand them into the bar. So just everyone should be on the lookout yeah. for that. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about the seal uh, because <coughs> do you think that <coughs> if the ledger would be like factory sealed somehow with the uh, hologram or something mm -hmm. would it solve anything or uh, it's you know it in theory it could um, if you knew you actually got a device that they manufacture that's definitely a much better position to be in the problem is actually knowing that is difficult and the reason it's difficult is actually well illustrated by a tweet of mine that I uh, come to think of it probably should add to the slides for the next time I give this talk, where I got a YubiKey. And the YubiKey was factory sealed with a little hologram and all that, and that uh, was very cool. And thought, you know, I wonder if I can get that thing out of there. So I got my tweezers out, and I kind of dug into the little thing and managed to go slip out the YubiKey past the hologram. Then I put in a different YubiKey without touching the hologram at all. Well, all right, so the hologram was lifted a little bit, but if you're going to notice that, you've got to look very closely. How many users are actually going to sit there very carefully inspecting every little seam of their package, every little hologram shining up through the light? I mean, obviously, some will. I mean, 10 of you raise your hands when you double-checked at your Bitcoin addresses, but a lot of users won't. And it's just difficult to get to the point where these things actually matter. You know, I've got a tracer in my backpack as well, and it's better, but the holograms is just, you know, two little things that say tracer. I'm pretty sure if I was a bad guy with the ability to go and man in the middle attack a supply chain, you know, at an even reasonably significant level, I could probably just call up some suppliers, you know, in China or Taiwan or where the, where the heck holograms are made these days, give them some photos of that and get some holograms that looked identical. Or even worse, I wouldn't even bother doing that. I'd just get holograms that didn't look identical and put them on there and hope no one notices the difference. Like one of um, Salem's very correct uh, things that he said about uh, Ledger was the photos they had of the device on the website to see is this a real device or not weren't very high resolution. You know, YubiKey is the same thing. How do I know what a YubiKey is even supposed to look like when I buy it? I don't. You know, yes, this could fix these problems, but I'm just not seeing people actually do this. And if you want to make this reliable, it's probably going to have to be something like a box that electronically detects compromise. And that's expensive. Um, so. Basically, hardware wallet, among other things, it also lets you know that the operation system doesn't, uh, cannot uh, do anything with, with, with what's happening on the wallet. So it, it, it uh, and if you have malware of or your computer, then it doesn't touch what's happening on the wallet. Do you think that some of those things can be imitated using a trusted execution environments like SGX? to make like a more secure electron wallet, which is more similar to hardware wallets? So, so if I understood the question, essentially you were asking, you know, what role could things like SGX have? And first and foremost, SGX kind of doesn't exist yet in the sense that it's very difficult to actually get access to the SGX te uh, technology. Um, I did read recently that supposedly Intel had opened it up with, you know, I should say previously, and it may be still true, SGX is required a license to get. So you may hear a lot about you know, SGX libraries, and there's a library for Rust as an example, tons of interest in it, tons of people doing stuff with it. But if you actually want to run SGX in production without the debug mode flag set, you at least previously have needed a license from, Bic or from Intel. And without that license, you can't actually run SGX in a secure way. Now supposedly that's changed, but I haven't actually gotten confirmation from anyone who's ever actually gotten it to work. And the Intel press release about this is very strangely worded, and I can't really make heads or tails of it myself. So I, I honestly don't know there. But let's assume it did exist. 
you would still need a trusted UI. Because you need to know that you know, when you're looking at your screen, you're actually looking at a, a thing controlled by the XGX part of the processor. You're, you know, you're looking at something secure. And again, this is kind of the same problem as I was mentioning with the ledger in general. I need to know that when I look at that screen, I'm looking at the output intended by the secure element. And from what I know about SGX, there's very little progress on actually making any of that possible. Secondly, even if you did have that, well, how do you know which address to send to? Your web browser isn't in the secure SGX enclave. You know, it's the exact same problem all over again, where, where did I get the address to send my Bitcoins to? I may go learn, uh, learn later that I was defrauded, but I'm not going to learn immediately, which is still a major problem. Uh, thank you for good speech. I want to ask you about, uh, about open source hardware. What do you think about open source hardware and about maybe we, c we can uh, create really trustless hardware wallet if we will use uh, only open source hardware and, uh, for example, open source 3D printer which can uh, print it. Which, which can uh, which can print it manually? Well, I mean, it's interesting to note with open source hardware thing that when I looked earlier today, just see can I find schematics for this? I couldn't, you know. And specifically, this is a Ledger and Nano S, and I thought there were schematics, but I couldn't find them today. So maybe I, maybe I was missing something there. But in general, well, I mean, you mentioned three D printers, for example. What of this could a 3D printer make? I mean, the case. That's really about it. You know, what of it? What of this is trusted? Well, the circuit board's trusted. Making circuit boards is hard. You know, it's really hard at the scale you need for modern electronics. I mean, as I say, th this used to be what I did for a living. And it's there's just so many obstacles to that. And then, of course. Look at microcontrollers, you know, integrated circuits, I mean, the, you know, the, all the silicon. That stuff's essentially impenetrable. I mean, people have hopes of making home fabs and so on, but I don't think you're going to get to the point where we even have a working microprocessor on a home fab anytime soon. You know, this might be a 10 year project or worse. It's just that difficult to make anything useful given the technology available. Now, there's clever things you can do. You can do things like use FPGAs, you know, which are field programmable gate arrays. Essentially, uh, it's like a piece, you know, like a silicon wafer in a sense, but you can reprogram what's on it. Now they're a lot slower than direct silicon, but at least they're a level of indirection. So it's much more difficult for the bad guy, assuming they've compromised your supply chain, to compromise the silicon in a way that it will then compromise the thing that you load onto it. Much in the same way as that, in general, software makes it difficult for hardware people to compromise what you're doing if they don't know in advance what software you're going to run. Right? How do I, like, how do I, as a bad guy, put extra gates onto the microprocessor in here that'll compromise a Bitcoin wallet that I don't even know exists yet? Which also means I can play interesting games like I can go buy the hardware from provably old stock, and sure, it's kept in secure storage then develop the stuff, and then do a production run. You know, there's lots of clever things I can do there, but they don't really involve sort of 3D printers and whatnot. They more involve clever supply chain hacks and sort of more standard electronics designs processes. So yes, I think there's room there, but it's tricky. And finally, I will say, if it's not open source, none of that really matters, and you're basically screwed. You know, you, you really, it has to be open source for any of that discussion to even matter. Anyone trying to sell you closed source hardware, you should be very skeptical of. You may not have a choice. I mean, I can't buy an open source laptop that actually performs well, but what choice do I have? Okay, more questions somewhere? Um, just uh, asking about the supply chain attacks. As far as I'm aware, the wallets like Tre Trezor, they are doing some kind of 
firmware check when they are initiated. And my question is, what protection does it offer to me according to you, and whether there are some extra steps which uh, I could do uh, to eliminate or mitigate this uh, supply chain risk? Well, Tracers, um, and I could be wrong on the more recent Tracer, but at least the, the original Tracer do not have a secure element in them. You know, they're not attesting to the, the originality of the device to the computer. But I think you can make pretty good arguments that even when you do do that, it doesn't actually help much. You know, and that gets back to what I was talking about, for instance, about USB attacks. Once you've connected compromised hardware to your computer, it's pretty easy for that compromise to go into your computer. And at that point, I mean, what, what do you do next? Equally, if your threat model is you assume your computer's compromised, when you purchase the device, it didn't actually help you necessarily if the attacker has any ability to control the combination of the two. You know, and maybe the way to go put it is this probably is better, but you still got to ask the question, is this really better than just buying a separate laptop with off-the-shelf hardware? You know, the u user interface will be better, the processing power available is better, and so on. So it's, you know, it's not a clear-cut thing. And I would be very dubious about people who push secure elements that hard. And the other thing with secure element is the chips available to actually implement them, you need NDAs. You know, nearly every, I mean, I really should say nearly, every example I've ever seen of a reasonably useful secure element, you've needed an NDA to get access to the data sheet to know how to program it. Well, once you have your NDA, how do then I let you as an open source developer collaborate with me? Are you going to go get an NDA? I mean, probably not. So that radically restricts your pool of people who can actually work on this stuff. Whereas Tracer, their philosophy so far has been don't use special hardware, use something that people can inspect fully. And, you know, given all the considerations, that may be the right answer. So what is your solution? What is the best uh, way to store Bitcoin today? I guess to build my own hardware and to write my own software, isn't it? I mean, when you say best, you got to talk about trade-offs, right? Like the, the, the badge, you know, that they gave us. That is probably the worst Bitcoin hardware wallet I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and the reason why it's so bad is all it is is little off-the-shelf NFC chips and a button. And when you press the button, it connects the chip to the antenna. And when you pay, the chip takes a, a private key stored you know, on the chip itself, sends it to the person you're paying, who then makes the transaction for you. Long story short, when you go pay me, I can take all your money. Simple as that. Well, I did go use mine. I put 30 bucks on it, because I'm not really worried about losing 30 bucks. You know, it just it doesn't really matter that much. It's not likely enough to happen. So for that, I was still willing to use the worst hardware wallet in existence. Meanwhile, I mean, let's suppose that I'm storing 100 bucks. Or hell, let's say 1,000 bucks. What would I do then? I don't know. Maybe I'd go and use an old phone I had lying around and just, you know, install some software off the App Store and keep it separate from my other phone where I actually do web browsing. You know, phones sitting in a corner somewhere most of the time that isn't, you know, actively doing things is probably reasonably secure. So I'm, I'm willing to go trust that for, you know, some small amount of money. Let's go a little higher. What if this is my life savings? What if this is, all right, I better not say a number because then you'll know what my life savings is. But what if this is some big amount of money? Maybe I'll spend you know, a day or two futzing around getting some system with multi-sig across you know, two computers I'd bought with cash while wearing a mask. You know, maybe I'll use multi-sig with one of these devices and something else. Right? There's, there's options there. Well, let's go a little higher. You know, I've had consulting clients who were, their business plans at least, I don't know how much they actually got along with this, but their business plans were storing billions of dollars. You know, that's enough money that if you were asked, say, uh, your local highway department, they could go and tell you how many lives it could save. The going rate for the US, if I remember correctly, is about on the order of like $10 million per life. 
So you lose a billion dollars and you killed a thousand, you know, killed a hundred people, roughly, kind of. That's when you start doing things like saying, well, how am I going to solve the supply chain? How am I going to investigate what software is going on there? How am I going to use different teams at once to do multi-sigs? This, you know, things get very difficult. But the important thing is, what's your risk? How much are you securing? And how do you, how do you come up with a plan where the amount of effort you're putting into is commiserate with the risk? And unfortunately, the real answer I can probably give is in most cases, none of this stuff's very secure. You know, modern computing is not done in a secure way. So, yeah, I don't have a good answer. I was also thinking of, like, when you said using off-the-shelf hardware, what about something like a Raspberry Pi or like a smaller, more portable device that's also mass-produced, not only used for Bitcoin, you can buy it with cash also in a shop pretty much anywhere? No, I mean, I think Raspberry Pis are potentially a great idea. Um, one annoying thing about Raspberry Pi is it doesn't have the user interface, you know, it doesn't have a keyboard, doesn't have a monitor, and those are, in theory, potential avenues of attack. But there's a lot of places you go buy a keyboard and monitor from, so I'm not as worried about that. And I'll say, I mean, as an example, I personally, I've used Raspberry Pis to get data off things that I suspect might be compromised. You know, it's a slightly different use case, but it's more, it's an off-the-shelf thing, it's really cheap, it's unlike what the attacker is probably expecting, and once it's done, I can turn it off and it'll probably not have any persistent state. Now, unfortunately, Raspberry Pis, if I understand the way their bootloaders work, the bootloader itself is not read-only, so there's state in a Raspberry Pi. But certainly for the Bitcoin use case, you can buy one off the shelf. 99% of them are probably going to kids with zero dollars, so there's very little incentive to attack them. Uh, I agree with your uh, attack vectors on the hardware wallets, but I also see a great array of uh, attack vectors to like mobile phones, Raspberry Pis, and laptops. Once you have them, you have to keep them under your eyes 24-7, because like an evil mate attack happening, it's way easier to compromise a laptop than to compromise like in an evil mate scenario, uh, a hardware wallet if you don't know what to expect. So. It's not clear to me that's true. You know, and again, the reason is, if that's a type of attack, I can still go replace your hardware wallet with the thing I probably would have used to go compromise your laptop in the first place. You know, I mean, let's assume you have reasonable laptop security, you put some you know, glitter epoxy on the seams and things like that. It's relatively difficult for me to take your laptop and put something in it without using the kind of attack vectors that I probably could have done through a hardware wallet anyway. You know, it's not a clear one or the other answer, but it's not clear to me that this is enough of an advantage in those kind of scenarios to want to, you know, use a device like this. The other point I'd make is, well, maybe what we really need is simpler hardware wallets where all they are is purely key storage and they don't try to do a UI just to make things easier and more, you know, contain what exactly they're doing better. You know, that'd be more like a YubiKey. But, I mean, it's tricky. I don't really have great answers there. You know, versus also, like, suppose you do put your Bitcoins on a phone. It's certainly easier to carry around a phone. So maybe that's a better trade-off too, right? Be, a, be in a position to better keep physical custody of it. You know, sorry, I don't have a clear answer there, but I think you just have to think very carefully about what your risks are. And, you know, you make a good point, but whether or not that applies to different people, it's, it's hard to say. Okay, more questions? Okay. So in terms of uh, low time preference development, I'm 
think in long term, what would be the, the things we should uh, aim for in the, let's say, 30 to 50 years? 30 to 50 years, I mean, so in 30 to 50 years, I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure war won't have broken out in any major countries. We probably will have a democracy still. I mean, it, it's really hard to say. I, I, I think, I mean, after all, 30 to 50 years is long enough you could go and develop modern chips from scratch, assuming you had the money. And I, I think it would just be an interesting question. You know, is it true that you need to pour a vast amount of resources to make chips that are worth using? Maybe there's a shortcut. You know, maybe there's some clever thing you can do with bioengineering to make something that can go compute shots to its hashes and run code that you can grow in a test tube. I really don't know. But for what we do know, 30 to 50 years doesn't actually help you that much. Because based on known science at least, there is no way to reconstruct that whole supply chain to get to the point where you know you have the ability to create things from scratch in a decentralized way. Now, if you're a government, on the other hand, I mean, let's suppose you know, you're the military of Canada and you're trying to defend yourself against the American invaders, it might be worth it to reconstruct chip fabs from scratch. But you know, we're talking probably tens of millions of dollars to go do this, you know, or at least reusing things that are sitting in universities and so on. And it's just not clear whether these prices will go down. You know? I mean, I make the point, like, my understanding of the chip fab business is essentially that every time chips get cheaper, the fabs to make them get more expensive. You know, it's like you're pouring mass amounts of resources into capital to make this thing ch cheaper per unit price. It's not that we've gotten better at making chip fabs, we just poured more money into them. Okay, so last question. Hi, Peter. Um, I saw the live stream, or some of it, from last year here, and you were on a panel, and you made a comment that wasn't followed up on by anybody, and it stuck in my head. It was about Bitcoin, and you said, uh, if we eliminate cash, then Bitcoin's fucked, or something like that. <laughs> and then there was nothing more said about it because the panel continued. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that point, if you think it's useful. Yeah so, uh, yeah, so that's kind of a separate topic, but essentially, you know, if, if you eliminate cash, is Bitcoin fucked? And uh, I'm pretty sure I use the word fucked too. But I think the answer to that is basically, yeah, I mean, how are you going to go buy your Bitcoin if every means of giving value to me is controlled? You know, yes, you can go work for me, you can do something useful for me, but this just doesn't scale very well. You know, I need some way of getting a significant amount of money from you to go and give me a reason to then give you Bitcoins back. Now, maybe if you kind of bootstrap to the point where Bitcoin is sort of an economy and there's a full circular flow of Bitcoin, that, that argument wouldn't be true. But if you're not at that point, it's not clear how it survives without the ability to buy and sell things anonymously that aren't Bitcoin. You know, it's, it's tricky. I'm, I'm not that hopeful in that kind of scenario. And, and after all, like what's kind of coming down the pipeline is there are proposals and efforts to do things like make owning wealth in general that's unregistered illegal. You know, there are people who want to make owning an artwork to be something you have to go fill out a whole bunch of forms on to make sure that the government knows where that artwork is, knows who to contact to go seize it, and knows where it's going to go the next time you go sell it. And in that kind of environment, well, what are you going to trade to get your Bitcoin in the first place? Indeed, I mean, it may be the other way where Bitcoins are relevant anyway because everything of value that you wanted to move has a little chip in it with a GPS in. You know, will this happen? I'm not really sure, but certainly plausible. So I would, I would really say to tech people, you know, don't think the tech is enough. You got to go fight political fights at the same time. You know, the tech makes it easier to fight political fights and fighting the politics makes it easier to be in environments where you can fight with tech, but you sh can't assume one or the other is sufficient. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And also let me announce that there will be a charity auction of uh, golden Ross Ulrich uh, coin in 10 minutes from 8 p.m.
Hier in Slavárna.